long. Sorry, my mic was off, everybody. I do not plan on speaking for very long this morning, but let's turn into the Word of God. I want to begin in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9. Jesus is talking about praying. His disciples say, will you teach us to pray? And so Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray you, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done and on, in earth as it is in heaven. Verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today, I just want to focus on one portion of Scripture. One bit. Verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. There is a lot that Jesus said in that short little example of prayer. There is a lot that was said, but that one I want to I point out this morning. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That word debtor comes from this Greek word of alites. I'm using the Strong's Concordance and their pronunciation of the word, I believe I'm pronouncing it right, is of alites. It comes from the word of of alialeho. And I'm trying not to sound like I'm yodeling up here. But it means to owe, to morally fail in duty, to be bound in debt or guilty. Forgive us, God, as we forgive the people who have morally failed us. Forgive us, Lord, as we forgive those who have failed in duty, who owe us who are guilty. We need to be able to forgive people. And you know how I've said it many times where I'm preaching to myself? Well, this sermon, I'm going to get into it in a minute, but this sermon came to me because God was correcting me. God was giving me a little adjustment. And so today I'm preaching to myself. And so I hope everybody here can benefit from it, but I'm going to be honest, I'm preaching to myself this morning. If that's okay with everybody. I believe this is a word for somebody else as well. But I'm definitely preaching to myself. Now when we are hurt by someone, When someone does us wrong, we feel like we're owed something. We feel like revenge is only right, that vengeance is only right, that we deserve retribution because they did me wrong. They messed up, they did it on purpose, they, whatever the case may be, they did me wrong. And that's not okay. I want people to not mess up. I want people to do the right thing about me. And so when they hurt me, I'm owed something. That's the natural opinion. That's the natural thought. My father was a great man. He has since passed away. My father was a great man up until alcoholism got a hold of him. 
And because of that, my dad wasn't around. My dad wasn't there for me. Alcoholism took him away from me. And because of that, I didn't really have a childhood. My childhood was robbed from me. Because of that, I grew up without a father figure, without a lot of childhood memories. I've got childhood memories from before he was given into alcoholism. I've got childhood memories dancing in the kitchen. I've got memories of him helping me practice my batting. He would throw a thing of socks so that I could practice seeing the ball. But they all kind of stop. They all kind of stop as soon as that alcoholism took over. He wanted to be my dad still, but he wanted that alcohol more. And so I spent about a decade or more than a decade hating my dad hating my father because of what he took from me. He took my childhood. He took that away from me, and I felt I was owed something. The only way I felt I was going to get that back was by hating him. The only way I felt that I was going to get something back was by hating him. And so I spent a decade hating him. And I was, I was spoken to from God many, 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 many times through preaching of the word and through my leadership that would say, no, you need to forgive him. And I'd say, what? I need to, don't you know I'm owed something here? No, Nate, you need to forgive him. No, you need to forgive him. Don't you know what he's done to me? Don't you know the, the, the memories that I could have had, that I should have had? Don't you know? Don't you understand? No, Nate, you need to forgive him. No, Nate, you need to forgive him. Now, if we say we should get what we deserve, I'm owed what I deserve, then we need to look back to the cross. Jesus took our place. Jesus took our place in what we deserved. See, that cross was designed for me. I messed up. I sinned, and then I sinned again, and then I sinned again, and then I sinned again. That cross was meant for me. But Jesus said, don't worry, Nate. I'm not going to let you get what you deserve. I'll take your place for you on this. It goes both ways. So who am I to think that I'm better than God, that I deserve? When he took our place. In fact, while Jesus was on the cross, if we look at Luke 23 and 34, while Jesus was on the cross, he's praying, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. As they were gambling, as they were figuring out who's going to get his old clothes. He's on the cross dying, being beaten, bloody, having a hard time breathing, saying, Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Luke 6 and 28 says, bless them that curse you. Pray for them which despitefully use you. So the question I'm asking this morning is not, can you pray? Can you pray for those who do you wrong? Can you pray for somebody who hurts you? Can you pray for somebody who opposes you? Can you pray for somebody who's taken advantage of you? If we look at David and Saul, King Saul wanted David dead. 1 Samuel 20 and 31, this is David talking to his own son. He says, don't you know, as long as David is alive, you're not going to be king. We need to have him killed. 
We need to have him killed. He needs to die. Now, here's the impressive thing. David was the enemy to Saul. Saul had him at the top of the list. David needs to die. But we look at it from David's perspective. Saul was not an enemy to David. Saul wanted David dead, but David did not want Saul dead. David was not an enemy to Saul. David had the chance to kill Saul. Saul was sleeping in a cave. David was able to walk up to him. In fact, his men said, in 1 Samuel 24, his men said, look, God has given your enemy into your hand. God has given him here. All you got to do is just a... And the kingdom's yours. Take over. And the kingdom is yours. So David went in and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David's heart struck him because he had cut off that corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid me that I do this thing against the Lord's anointed because God had put him up there. Because he is the Lord's anointed. Just because someone calls you their enemy doesn't mean to be, doesn't mean they need to be. Just because somebody says, you're my enemy, doesn't mean they need to be your enemy. Amen? In fact, Jesus said in Luke 6 and 35, love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. You shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. He is kind. When somebody is unthankful, anybody ever dealt with that? You do, you do something great. You try and help somebody out. You do something for them. And next thing you know, they're not even thankful for it. They don't even give you, okay, thanks. It's just, oh, nice. All that work you did. Being kind to the unthankful and to the evil. So I'm asking this morning, can you pray for someone who hates you? This is not an easy subject to talk about. This is not one of those exciting subjects to talk about. This is something that God was talking to me about. Can you pray for someone who hates you? And I've thought about this before. I've thought about our American troops being overseas fighting enemies who are terrible, who are almost not human in some of the things they do. And I, I think that they're the scum of the earth. They're the worst. They're the low of the lows. Why, why even have them around? They should all just perish. And then I think, wait, I need, I need to be praying for them. The Bible says I'm supposed to be praying for my enemies. You know why? Because that's still a soul. That's still a soul. And if the roles were reversed, you would want them praying for you. Can you pray for someone who hates you? The last person I want to look at is Stephen. He can be found in Acts chapter 7. Now, Stephen was on trial for being a Christian. Stephen was on trial for being a Christian. The church leaders did not like him. They set up false witnesses against him. And so Stephen starts speaking the truth. He starts just preaching. He's on trial. He's in the middle of the room. Everybody's looking at him. Stephen just starts going to town. He starts preaching. And they didn't like it. They didn't like it at all. And so verse 54, when they heard these things, they were enraged. They started grinding their teeth at him like, oh. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And so you know what he does? Verse 56. He says, look, the heavens opened up and I see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Verse 57, that did it. They cried out with a loud voice 
and stopped their ears. They wouldn't listen to him, and they rushed together at him. They all came. They grabbed him. Verse 58, they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. The witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Verse 59, as they were stoning Stephen, as he's having stones pelting his body, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And verse 60, falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Lord, don't hold this sin against them. So I ask you, I ask me, can I pray for my executioner? Can I pray for the person that is killing me? Can I pray for the person that it's their job, it's their duty, it's their whatever? Can I pray for the person that is killing me? See, now, normally, if somebody comes up and is trying to hurt me, that engages fight or flight. Fight or flight happens. And because I'm a goober, sometimes I think about that. Sometimes I think about if somebody put up a gun in my face, was wanting my money, or was just wanting something, you know, what would I do? How would I respond? How would I react? And one scenario that I was thinking about, I was thinking, okay, the terrorist comes into Walmart or whatever, and I'm ready to go. What am I going to do? I'm going to get up here. I'm going to be ready to fight. I'm going to grab my family. I'm going to, you know, go in through the whole list, and I'd be able to stop him by putting him down or whatever. And God stops me and says, Nate, what if I asked you to, the, to pray for them? And I was like, oh. Gun in your face. What if God asked you to lay hands on them? I was like, can you pray for your executioner? See, it's great to be able to pray. It is essential to be able to pray. It is essential to be able to pray for your family, your, the lost, the church, your leadership. Can you pray for the ones who are hurting you? Can you pray for your enemies? Can you pray for your executioner? It's not an easy thing to do. It goes against everything that I've got wired in my brain right now. Everything in my brain says I need to fight, I need to stop the threat, I need to do whatever. But if God tells me to do something, I need to be willing to listen to God. Now, is that saying I'm going to be a doormat, that I'm going to be walked on, or that if my life was being threatened, I'm not going to fight? No, I truly believe I will do that, but I need to be able to pray for them. And if that means knock them out, knock the gun out of their hand, and then start praying for them, then I'm going to do that. <laughs> or if I have a gun, I shoot them in the leg, drop them down, and then start praying for them. <laughs> They're kneeling, so it's ready to go. But <laughs> can I pray for my executioner? Can I pray for somebody whose job it is to kill me? Stephen was wrongly accused. The system that was meant to make sure nobody was falsely accused, that system that was set in place had been twisted against him. So he was wrongly accused because people were just trying to get rid of him. He should not have died. There was no reason he should have died. He should not have been stoned outside of the city, yet with everyone against him, with the whole system working against him, he was praying for the people that were killing him. He was praying for the people that were killing him. Why do we need to pray? James 5 and 16, the very ending there that says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Prayer has power. Prayer has power, more power than any weapon. 
Prayer has more power than any hand-to-hand -hand combat, any training I could do. Prayer has more power in it. Why do we need to pray? Because there's power in prayer. Romans 12 and 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. If we're following God and we feel we're owed to something, God's going to take care of it. It might not be in our timeline. It might not be in our life. God's going to take care of it. Amen. If we could all stand, that is, that is where I'm going to wrap up. If we could.